Hey, hey, party people. A while back, I asked y'all across my social media what your video requests were, and this video's topic had the most votes, and I will read it. Can you make a video on how to define your brand's aesthetic, like finding your voice as a designer in the industry when you're opening your own fashion company, and how to stand out in the crowd, how to develop and find that one thing that makes you unique and is hard for competition to take away? Okay. And I got a lot of requests similar to this one as well. Before we start, I just want to say that you can't stop the copiers. Okay. If you're doing something cool, someone will try to copy you. Okay. It's just the nature of the industry. You just have to do the best version. Okay. So without further ado, let's get into it first by discussing brand aesthetics and house codes of some famous fashion houses and then discuss what we can learn from them. First up, what is a brand's aesthetic? It's basically the style of a brand that has been cultivated using the company ethos, the customer profile, and the creative director's vision. What are house codes? House codes are specific shapes, colors, fabrics, imaging, details used by a brand repeatedly to help visually establish their authenticity aesthetic to the world, especially their customers. Okay. You know, house codes, they're not just cute stuff. I like quote unquote house codes are about heritage. House codes are imbued with meaning and history. House codes reference the designer's muse and customers. House codes visually define the brand through repetition, regardless of who the creative director is. Okay. Let's go over a few houses and their codes. This won't be a deep dive, but a little smattering so you can get the general idea. Let's talk about Lanvan's aesthetic and house codes. I'd say that Lanvan's house aesthetic can be summed up in one word, romantic. A sweet lusciousness, sumptuous materials, rich feminine details, all with a romantic air. Now let's touch on some of the specific house codes that help build this romantic aesthetic. And in no particular order, number one, Jean Lanvin's family, especially her daughter, is a central pillar of the Lanvin house codes. The Lanvin logo is that of a mother and child. It's Jean Lanvin herself with her daughter Marguerite. And modern iterations of the logo still retain the distinct mother and daughter design. And it's used in logos and also in prints. Jean Lanvin has said that she found her daughter continuously inspiring, that her daughter was her muse, and referenced her family in her collections. The Lanvin daisy motif is symbolic of her daughter and is occasionally called the Marguerite daisy. Number two, hats. Jean Lanvin got started creating hats during an apprenticeship when she was 16 and opened her own millinery studio in 1889. She would make clothes for her daughter Marguerite and people would ask her to make adult sized versions of these ensembles. So Lanvin expanded her business into dressmaking. Number three. Lanvin Blue, a.k.a. Quattrocento Blue, was inspired by a Fra Angelico fresco in Florence that Lanvin once visited in her travels in the 1920s. She even opened her own dye factory to produce this shade, which is a house staple. Other Lanvin house codes include Lanvin's love of art deco. She even opened a home decor shop in Paris with an architect and designer who also helped Lanvin design her own house using, of course, copious amounts of Lanvin blue. If you watch my fashion history videos, then you already know about Lanvin's robe de steel dresses as an alternative to the straighter flapper silhouettes of the 20s. For homework, go look at some of Albert Albaz's collections for Lanvin and see how he had masterfully recreated that Lanvin romance and included some of the house codes while interpreting them in a modern way. Lanvin is not the only house that was so inspired by a color that they incorporated into their brand. And some, some of these colors are now official Pantone colors. There's Patu Blue, Valentino Red, Scaparelli Pink, and Elmes Orange. 
Speaking of Hermes, let's talk about Hermes. Hermes began as a small harness workshop in Paris, which explains their logo, and how they branched out from leather harnesses to other leather goods. Modern collections still hark back to Hermes's equestrian roots. Hermes packaging was originally beige and gold imitation pigskin, and then later mustard and brown, still in imitation pigskin. During World War II, many materials were unavailable or tightly rationed, including the materials used to make this imitation pigskin, and along with more neutral dyes. But paper products were available, orange dye was available, and et voila, a fantastic example of restrictions spurring creative solutions that elevate the original. Speaking of war shortages inspiring creativity, let's touch on Gucci a bit. Gucci was founded by a man named Gucci o Gucci, which explains the double G logo. Gucci's visual aesthetic has undulated in stylistic markers over the years under different creative directors, but the common themes are that of opulence, a sense of rich otherworldliness, and a heightened display of each era's sense of sexuality. More overt and dirty with Tom Ford, romantic and lush with Frida Giannini, more gender fluid and quirky with Michele, capturing each era's zeitgeist. Back in the day, Gucci o Gucci had worked at the Savoy, a hotel in London, where he had been inspired by the aesthetic of the English racing set. And this sparked a long history of using equestrian-inspired shapes and details overlaid on top of the general aura of prestige sport and wealth. The double G print on cotton with the red and green stripe was a design improvisation as a result of material shortages during, yes, again, World War II, forcing the house to start using cotton for their goods. That red and green stripe is now so ingrained in Gucci visual storytelling that the Gucci movie trailer graphics featured the red and green stripe. And yes, I'm very excited to watch the Gucci movie. The Versace aesthetic is bold and sexy, featuring strong colors and prints, heavy on the gold, both in the color and the metal. Versace women exude strength, sometimes to the point of being intimidating, but in a very sexy way. The Medusa head is an instantly recognizable symbol of the Versace brand, as is that Greca border motif. Gianni Versace grew up in a part of southern Italy that remained highly influenced by ancient Greek culture and tradition. And this Versace iconography comes from Gianni Versace's childhood memories of exploring ancient ruins. And they mark much of their merchandise from ready to wear, shoes, bags, bedding, everything. This influence also lends to other often seen Versace hallmarks such as slinky dresses inspired by ancient Greek chitons and pleats, armor shapes, and leather strappings inspired by ancient Greek warriors. And you know, you can't have an Issey Miyake collection without pleats. And you know, Chanel codes are fairly well known at this point. Pearls, watches, hats, black and white, tweed, chains with ribbons running through them, camellias, her favorite flower, padded or quilted looks in both clothing and accessories, you know. So now we've gone over some of that. Let's discuss what we can learn from the big name fashion houses on how to develop your own aesthetic and house codes. Number one, you can't fake the funk. I mean, inspiration. You can't fake the inspiration. You don't choose inspiration. Inspiration chooses you. If you look at something or experience something and you don't feel the urge to create, sketch, sew, doodle, if it doesn't make you follow a wandering path of ideas, that thing is literally not inspiring you and therefore literally cannot be your inspiration. Well then, Zoe, how do I find inspiration? Take something that is true to you and your roots. When it's personal, when it's rooted in who you are as a person and your personal experiences beyond who you are as a designer, no one can take that away from you. How many houses did we talk about earlier that started with leather goods and horse stuff, but each added their own aesthetics to growing their brands? Yeah, I said horse stuff. It's, it's horse stuff. Okay. In the examples I talked about earlier, 
many of those designers embrace things organically in their lives, their families, their childhood homes, their travels, their favorite things. Go live your lives, but also get out of the house and open your eyes to the world around you and pay attention. Go visit gardens and museums. Don't just look at fashion stuff. Travel if you can. Be a tourist in your own city. Watch movies. Daydream. Sketch. Listen to music. Document everything. Expose yourself to many things and see what calls to you. If you can't find something to be passionate about, find something you're curious about and follow that path of questions and research. Drop me a comment if you want a video on inspiration and tell me your specific questions about inspiration. I'll drop some links on videos on concept development and mood boards in the description box. Number two, practice designing. For students, this means going from rough sketches all the way to tech packs. For those of you trying to start companies, by practicing design, I mean go all the way from vague rough sketch to complete garment or accessory worn by a person. Doodling ideas in a sketchbook is not practicing design. You have to work out the logistics of getting something made for it to be true practice. You don't practice running by looking out at the track. An idea without execution is only a daydream. Every time we do a new design project, we learn something new. We learn something about what we like, what we don't like. We learn about our aesthetic preferences as much as we learn about the practical logistics of design. And as you practice, you'll find yourself gravitating towards certain looks, fabrics, colors, shapes, prints, all of that. And that, my friends, is your aesthetic, your style beginning to emerge. And if you're sitting there, oh, Zoe, I already know what I like. Listen, often we don't know what we don't know. In high school, it was gowns, gowns, gowns. Yeah, I loved a lot of things about fashion, but I really only wanted to design gowns, especially wedding gowns. And then when I got to fashion school, I fell in love with working with denim and leather. They're still two of my favorite materials to work with. And I still love gowns, but in a completely different way, di completely different aesthetic from before. And you know what? I thought I would always hate menswear. Nope. And I thought swimwear would be fun. Nope. And so on and so on. And I didn't need school for this per se, but I did need to do a bunch of different projects to learn these things about myself. Do lots of practice design projects with difficult prompts and stick to the brief. Whether you write that brief yourself or get an assignment at school. Number three, you can start with a single item category. Everyone thinks it's some new, funky, marketing forward way of doing business and the old school way was to start doing full runway shows. No. Listen, if you have the money and you can start with full collections, but it's not the only viable option. Lamban and Chanel started with hats. Scaparelli started with a single sweater. Ralph Lauren started by selling neckties. Prada, Gucci, Hermes all started in small leather goods. Louis Vuitton made trunks. And now they're all huge brands with many, many product categories, but they all started with one. Diane von Furstenberg started with one wrap dress. The lingerie sector has new companies disrupting the industry every day by starting with one amazing bra, one amazing panty. Pick a category you're obsessively in love with. If you're not obsessively in love with it, don't even bother, okay? Pick one you're obsessively in love with, do your research, perfect a small group of offerings, be great at your thing, be noteworthy at your thing, and expand slowly. And this is merging points two and three, but don't launch your brand with the first thing you've ever designed. But Zoe, I have this concept and I'm building my empire around my concept. Okay, yeah, but are you sure there aren't better ways of creating that? more beautiful or different iterations, more efficient, more cost-effective with better materials, more locally sourced for shorter shipping times. Put down your ego and really analyze. Number four, you don't need to reinvent the wheel every collection. In fact, you shouldn't. You should take your favorite themes, your most popular themes, and rework them into new iterations over and over again to start building your signature, your house codes. 
if you watch the documentary Unzipped, which chronicles Isaac Mizrahi's rise and fall, then you already know that part of the reason why he went bankrupt is he refused to give customers what they wanted because he was like, I already did that. Okay? But seriously, how many versions of the Chanel Camellia have you seen? And they still continue to be wildly popular after all these years. I'd like you to think about your brand as a book. Every collection is a chapter in the book. The content of each chapter is new and different than the one before, but it's still part of the same story. It's a continuation of the same story. Now you may be thinking, but Zoe, my teacher hates it when I repeat something project to project. They always tell me to do something new. Well, yes, when you're in school, the point is to push yourself to the outer reaches of your creativity, to explore under a guiding hand, to play as much as possible until you start discovering what works for you, what doesn't, what's unique, what's not, all those things. Those are your beginning stages. But once you've understood your design style, you can start playing with repeating themes. Number five, define your customer and let that be the backbone of your whole company. I go into this more deeply in a video. I'll link in the description box below who is your customer, but I also talk about this all the time. You can't have a cohesive brand aesthetic and business direction if you're not keeping your customer in mind. You have probably already seen or read interviews with designers talking about who the Versace woman is or who the Chanel woman is, et cetera, et cetera. Number six, don't let restrictions, limitations, so-called problems stop you from creating something great, even iconic. Okay. The next time your teacher wants you to work on a project you don't want to do, the next time your money guy says you need to tighten up your budget, the next time you don't want to do something because sustainability cramps your style, I want you to think about Hermes being told, uh, <laughs> my dude, <laughs> the world is at war and we don't care about your fancy imitation pigskin boxes. Figure it out. Creativity doesn't actually thrive when someone is allowed to do whatever. Design things it never occurred to you to design. Design categories that don't interest you. Challenge yourself to make it interesting. Design with very, very cheap fabrics. I was forced to follow design briefs I initially hated while I was in school, but I am a far better designer for it. If you do things that are only easy to you, you'll never grow. It's like working out. You have to do all the reps. You have to increase the weights you lift. You have to bike more miles to grow your muscles. But the soreness you feel is literally your muscles breaking apart to grow stronger. Do that with your brain. And that's it for today. Please give this video a thumbs up if you learned something new today. It really does help my channel. Subscribe, share this video with your fellow designers and drop your questions and video requests below. Check the description box for links to related videos and I'll see you in the next video.